Broadcasting live from our studio in Boston, Solutions Review is proud to showcase Monte Carlo in the Solution Spotlight, a unique online event for industry professionals. I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review, and welcome to the Solution Spotlight featuring Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo created the data observability category around three years ago to help businesses eliminate data downtime. Just as we've seen in the application dev space with monitoring tools such as Datadog and New Relic, Monte Carlo is on a mission to bring the same level of automation and sophistication to data teams and data consumers. Our goal with the Spotlight series is to share with you the latest innovative enterprise technology. And what you're about to see is an end-to-end -end solution for your data stack that monitors and alerts for data issues across data warehouses, data lakes, ETL, and business intelligence. The platform uses machine learning to infer and learn your data, proactively identify data issues, assess its impact, and notify those who need to know. And to join us to walk us through the Monte Carlo solution is John So, Head of Product Marketing, and Ethan Post, Sales Engineer. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having us, Doug. Thanks for having us. Well, it's, a, it's great that you're here, and it's great that you're here actually uh, at the beginning of the year uh, because we, um, our editor, Tim King, our, our data management editor, Tim King, um, did a Top Trends article, and one of his top trends is data observability for uh, Top Trend for 2023. So I think this is timely. Uh, it's certainly something that our editorial team is covering uh, and is. Uh, I think it's going to be fascinating today. Before we get going, um, I'd love to just get a little bit more about your backgrounds. John, why don't you go first and uh, tell us a little bit more about how, you, how you've come to Monte Carlo. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so uh, I've been in the data space for some time. Uh, I was previously at, at a segment, the customer data platform. Um, and I think for myself, I think one of the reasons why I came to Monte Carlo is uh, I've also been a data analyst, very uh, deep in the database analytics. Uh, but also have been a consumer of dashboards um, since I've moved over to product marketing. Um, so I joined uh, Monte Carlo about a year ago, uh, heading up product marketing, and I'm very excited to be here today and um, share a little bit more about data observability and also answer any questions you all have. Great. Uh, and Ethan, how about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, by way of introduction, I'm a solutions engineer at Monte Carlo. Um, how I actually arrived at this role is uh, fresh out of grad school, I actually joined a consulting team uh, working as like a front end BI analyst. So this means building reports and dashboards for folks in the, in the land in terms of how organizations start to think about data. Uh, and as any good uh, data practitioner does, slowly work my way backwards, right? So learned about the specifics of building a data warehouse, what makes a good ETL uh, solution and strategy, and then working back source systems. All along the way, learning a lot of this is pretty shaky and, and folks get pretty mad when the data doesn't work, right? So, you know, Monte Carlo in terms of data observability and, and part of the reason I'm here is to help solve those types of problems that come up when there's many actors along a very complicated chain of events. Well, great. Well, I got most of that. I, we had a little bit of a, uh, a, little bit of a connectivity uh, issue there, but I think we'll get that sorted out. Um, in the interim, um, John, I'm going to throw it to you to do an overview of data observability and the Monte Carlo solution. And then I think we're going to take it uh, from there to Ethan uh, to do a bit of a demo, which I think will be a very nice, complete uh, look at the, at the solution and the platform. Um, to set everybody's expectations, we're happy to take questions, certainly. We always are looking forward to those. I'm going to have a few as well at the end, so if you want to submit any of your questions, feel free to do that uh, while the presentation is going on, and, and uh, we'll save some room at the end to, to get through anything that you have. Otherwise, John, I'm going to hand it to you. Um, why don't you give us a walkthrough of the, the Data Observability 101? All right. Thanks so much, Doug. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. I'm really excited to share uh, Data Observability uh, 101. Um, just to quickly cover off on uh, what we'll cover in the next hour or so with you. Uh, first thing we want to do is really define like what is data downtime? Um, the second is uh, how do you actually start building data trust and increasing adoption of data products that, um, that are built? Uh, and last and certainly not least, we want to show you how uh, you and your teams can do this in action. So as Doug mentioned, Ethan will actually show you um, a demo of, our, of the data observability platform in action. 
and then we'll wrap today's session with Q and A. So, like Doug said, please ask questions in the chat throughout, and we'll make sure that we uh, answer them during the session. We love more interactive sessions, uh, and don't want to make this uh, just like any other webinar. So, anytime you have questions, please do just uh, just ask, and we'd be more than happy to ask uh, answer them. Um, so, what question is? What is data downtime? Um, and the best way to really explain anything these days uh, is with a meme. Um, and this one is from an artist uh, named Casey Green. Um, data downtime really refers to periods of time when your data is partial, erroneous, missing, or otherwise just inaccurate. Uh, hence this kind of burning room. Um, it's happening all the time across organizations right now. And it's something we've gotten quite accustomed to and constantly fixing and, and fighting fire drills, literally in this case, in this meme, um, to really deal with bad data. Um, and like I mentioned before, like when I had previously worked in analytics, um, it was something that I was often doing where I was running manual checks on making sure that the revenue totaled to what I would expect it to be, uh, making sure that a field didn't have any null values as I was trying to do analysis on it. Um, but it's something that we've all really gotten used to. Um, so if this meme resonates with you, uh, you're definitely not alone. Um, and if we were in a room together, uh, one question I always love to ask is to understand how much time folks are really spending on data quality. Uh, whether it's writing manual tests or answering questions from other teams or just fixing issues when they arrive. Um, unfortunately, we're not in a room today. Um, but typically what we uh, typically hear is uh, data engineers will spend up to, you know, up to half of their days just addressing data quality issues. Uh, and on the other side of it for data consumers, whether it's data scientists or analysts spend 80% um, of their time just really collecting, cleaning and preparing data for analysis. Um, so if this resonates with you, if you feel like you're spending a lot of time on whether it's fighting data fire drills and fixing issues or on the other side of it as a consumer, um, uh, spending a lot of time preparing data before you can actually build your models or uh, build your dashboards, again, know that you're certainly uh, not alone. Um, so why, why is this happening? Um, a big reason for why this is is because a lot of incidents are detected reactively today. And what I mean by that is we're all writing tests, we're all QAing our data, uh, but you can only really write tests for um, what, you're, uh, uh, what you can expect. Um, so what you expect to break, uh, that's what you can write tests for. And that typically from what we've seen across data teams is that only accounts for about 10% of the issues that will happen. The other 90%, and this might sound familiar, is those issues are caught by downstream consumers. So again, whether it's folks in data science, folks in data analytics, uh, different business teams with analytics functions, or even worse, an executive um, or even external, uh, your customers, or um, if you're a public company in the street, when you find issues in reporting uh, in the data itself, that's where a lot of the issues happen. And again, what we've seen from most of the data teams is this is a vast majority, up to 90% of the time, that's how incidents are getting, uh, uh, are getting caught. So the business impact then uh, of all this is research has found that this can potentially cost a company an entire quarter's worth of revenue. And that's a lot. So why, why is this happening? Um, the actual issue here, uh, when we really dug into it, when our co-founders, Bar Moses and Lyorkovich, uh, initially founded the company, they went around asking hundreds of data leaders, why does this happen? And we spoke to thousands of data teams since then. And the crux of it isn't bad technologies or bad employees but it's impossibility of scaling workflows to actually detect and resolve data issues. Upstream, you can't see what's gonna break further downstream. Uh, you can't always predict how data is gonna break. And then for data consumers, again, it's you know when things identi are identified, uh, when issues are identified, it's knowing who to reach out to upstream to either help triage an issue, help troubleshoot it, and ultimately help resolve it. The good news there, though, is bad data generally looks similar across all companies. Um, and just taking a look at the questions here is you're probably familiar asking yourself, uh, is this data set that I'm working on, is, actually, is it actually up to date? Why does this value look so off? Or why are there so many nulls? Um, again, I wish I could ask for a raise of hands of if you've asked yourself or asked other folks on your team these questions before. But um, I know, again, when I was in this space, it, it was definitely a question that I asked myself all the time. So then what is data observability? Well, when we looked at all these questions that were common across data teams and um, also well as consumers downstream, uh, we really realized they fit really nicely into really what we call five pillars. 
and we'll talk about each one of these now. So the um, the first four, freshness, volume, quality, and schema, are all around uh, monitoring um, and knowing when issues might arrive. The fifth lineage is really around then how do I, once I know that there's an issue, how do I start triaging? How do I start prioritizing? Is this something I need to drop everything and fix now? But then also conducting root causes is a critical element there. So we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Ethan will also cover more in the demo as well, but just want to give folks an overview of you know, how we uh, see data observability and some of the critical capabilities. Um, so the first is, is freshness. How up to date are your data tables? Or when was the last time they were updated? Um, freshness is particularly important when it comes to decision making. In this case here, you can see in the blue lines, that's what we typically expect. Uh, again, uh, Doug mentioned this, but we at Monte Carlo, we use machine learning to really understand historical behavior. And in this case, we were seeing updates every few hours. But then in, on the 27th, all of a sudden, we stopped seeing updates on this table. Uh, freshness issue has occurred. So that's just one example there. The next is volume. Um, volume is asking the question of how complete are your data tables? Am I getting the right amount of rows in a given update? And volume can offer insights into the health of your data sources. Um, so in this case, uh, again, using machine learning, uh, historically, we would expect around 51,000 rows in every update uh, around that range. You can see those updates uh, there. But in that red area that's shaded, we see a sudden spike of well over, I think, about 200,000 or so rows. So this is something that's likely uh, from an upstream source that we're seeing incremental events on. This can happen on things like, like a CDP platform. If all of a sudden we're getting an influx of events, maybe that's triggering something to happen in the pipeline. Maybe that's triggering something, for example, uh, um, uh, bot traffic that might be driving up all of a sudden your event, uh, your event data, for instance. The third is quality. So this is actually asking the question of, is your data in an acceptable range or is it usable? Um, this kind of goes into some of the more core data quality principles of like accuracy, for instance, and that gives you insight into whether or not the values itself of the data table uh, can be trusted based on what you expect from the data. Uh, in this particular example, there are two things that uh, the algorithm has detected. Uh, there are two particular fields where the mean has deviated from what we historically have seen in the past. And what's important about quality is these are, again, things that you can't necessarily predict and always write specific tests for. Uh, so for instance, uh, Monte Carlo covers about 20 plus metrics, including mean, percent null, percent unique, and automatically identifies when a specific field deviates from that expected um, range or distribution. Next is schema. Were any changes made to the organization of your data? Uh, we found that monitoring who makes changes to these tables and when is foundational to understanding the health of your data ecosystem. So you can see in this case here, a few columns were added and a few um, field types were actually changed. Now, this could be a completely expected behavior, uh, or it could have been done something on accident that needs to be flagged now, uh, or it could have caused an actual something to break downstream. Um, whether it was another table that was a dependency on the source table or, or um, it could be a BI dashboard that was expecting a certain field type. Um, so in that case, we want to be able to trace that back up to the original schema change. Um, so the last, again, these are all around monitoring. The last is around lineage. So once you've detected that an issue is broken, the common questions are now is how do I figure out where one of these issues took place upstream? Or how do I know who's impacted downstream or what specifically around, again, uh, dashboards and views? And that's where lineage comes in. Being able to understand the dependencies, both upstream and downstream, of every table in your production warehouse, uh, as well as how it's impacting downstream data consumers. So again, we've come to uh, refer to these as the five pillars of data observability. Uh, and we really believe every organization must develop these capabilities to monitor these pillars across their entire data stack to really ensure quality and trustworthy data. And that's really what we built uh, the world's first data observability platform around. Um, I won't go into too much detail here since Ethan's going to demo uh, how it all works and how it can help your team, but at a high level. Uh, Monte Carlo sits across your data stack from data lakes to orchestrators to data warehouses, uh, uh, and finally down to the BI tools uh, where your business teams are consuming the data. Um, by 
Collecting primarily metadata, query log, and aggregate statistics, data observability platforms should really help your team automatically detect freshness, volume, quality, and schema uh, anomalies across uh, your uh, across your stack. And when an incident is detected, it should notify the data team owners, any impacted downstream consumers, um, so they know not to use a certain dashboard until an issue has been resolved. But then more importantly, in addition to this detection element, the data observability platform should also not just sound the alarm, but give your data engineering teams the tools that they need uh, to really resolve an incident. Um, so uh, one thing that I'll, uh, I'll point out here is um, the, the different solutions and the ways you might be tackling uh, data reliability. Um, when this is typically where we see teams kind of evolve uh, as they go through, um, as they grow, both as a data team grows, as the organization grows and the dependencies on data grow and uh, the volume of data itself. When you first start off, um, testing is a very, is a, writing manual test is actually still a very uh, uh, effective way uh, of making sure that the data your uh, tables or your building and products that you're building are meeting your expectations. So being able to write just sanity checks uh, manually um, works. But as that grows, as your dependencies grows, as your volume of data grows, um, as resources become more constrained for your data team, some teams turn into more, uh, turn to more uh, monitoring solutions like open source solutions. This is what helps you write both um, the sanity checks, uh, but then also helps you more, in a more scalable way start applying those tests and monitors uh, to more uh, to more fields and tables that you actually designate. Uh, but again, you hit a certain maturity curve there because it still requires a lot of effort to maintain and build these tests. Uh, but then other things start slipping through the cracks as well. Because again, with monitoring, you're still writing checks and tests and monitors for what you expect to break. And that's where observability uh, is kind of the next evolution of this. And this is where we see typically teams when again, the volume of data that is there, the dependencies are there, um, the mission critical data driving the organization. That's where observability comes in that adds an extra layer of applying these monitors that we've talked about, uh, freshness volume, schema and quality to all of your production tables. But then more importantly is we don't just again want to detect issues, we need to resolve them as soon as possible so that we make sure the data is trustworthy and usable by both our internal stakeholders as well as any external customers if you have those dependencies. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stop uh, sharing slides here and really uh, turn it over to Ethan to, to demo what uh, data preservability platform looks like. Um, as we do this, uh, just keep in mind, uh, what if your team had some of these capabilities? What if they had the ability to detect incidents or anomalies as soon as they occur? And when they do occur, if they have the tools they need to really resolve those incidents. And what if you could down understand downstream impact altogether before making any kind of schema change um, so you can avoid these bad incidents. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Ethan to show you how this all works. Yeah, thanks, John. I appreciate it. And if, if you think about that framework that John just introduced, so the idea of detection, resolution, prevention, uh, I'm actually going to start at the end of that and work my way backwards, right? What we'll see here over the next, say, 25 to 30 minutes, consider it maybe a series of concentric circles where we're going to start pretty broad and focus on the, the strategic outcomes of what Monte Carlo can provide. And then we're going to get highly tactical in terms of what does an incident look like? What does a, a, or a technical resource actually do to go resolve that incident? So what I'm showing here is what we call our data reliability dashboard. The idea here being, since we're monitoring so broadly and we can account for so many things that break across complex data pipelines, we can actually serve up some very, very helpful metrics around things like table uptime, right? So what this is actually showing is a percent of tables that are healthy compared to a certain metric, right? So our machine learning freshness monitors versus volume monitors versus what we call field health. The idea is I can actually give data organizations some semblance of not only how we're doing currently, but how we're improving in terms of data quality over time. Uh, and oftentimes I'll kind of refer back to, uh, you know, production methodologies, lean manufacturing, things like the three nines, right? My goal as a data organization is to get as close to perfection as I can but that doesn't actually happen at a 50,000 foot view, right? Because in addition to looking at my um, 2,500 tables in Snowflake and whatever I'm doing out in other technologies, I also want to logically organize this according to how my organization actually sees data, right? So Monte Carlo has this inbuilt concept of domains, 
mapping to a lot of the modern ways that organizations are working with data. So in some cases, I might look at more vertical focused domains, right? Billing and payment or finance data or more horizontal domains or even mapping to a particular data product, right? So in this way, I can say, okay, well, billing and payment specifically, 21 tables, how are we doing in terms of data health and quality? 103 incidents in the last six months, doing horrible at, at actually updating status and responding to incidents. But what's even worse is taking 64 hours to respond to an incident. That's very poor, right? So tracking these metrics in the same way that, you know, DevOps or other organizations within IT are actually tracking um, success, failure, quality, those types of things is a, a level of heightened abstraction from just did something work or not that Monte Carlo is just going to provide out of the box, right? Another thing I'll call out is those domains themselves are actually highly functional in terms of observing data quality, right? So for billing and payment specifically, I'm not looking anywhere near three nines, right? It's more 66% of my tables are healthy in terms of freshness. That's pretty poor. So that's kind of what we're providing to data organizations as a whole or data owners and stewards. Uh, I think the other thing I'll call out is at a more granular level, what Monte Carlo is going to provide is observability at a particular data asset, right? So when I say data asset in this context, it means a table. So I have this table here called subscription. One of the most valuable things Monte Carlo is going to provide is this idea of, do I care about this table or not, right? The, the expansive growth of the modern data ecosystem means I'm going to have certain things out there that I probably just don't care that much about. I know this subscription table is actually the most important table. So when I think about a stoplight that actually gives me some indication of health here, okay, all the SQL rules I have in place for this table look good. Freshness, good. I've had a volume incident recently, so that's something I need to look into. But this is kind of your lens into not only the health of your data at a high level, but also paring that down to an actual data asset to get some sense of where I'm doing well and where I'm not. So again, that is kind of the, the output of this whole process, right? How can data organizations use Monte Carlo to get better and prevent data downtime in key areas? What I'll do next is actually dive into more of that um, you know, data observability and monitoring methodology. So if I tab over to this monitors tab, the thing that I'll always say here is your ability to monitor or observe the quality of data is directly relational in, in, in most cases to the amount of assets you have, right? So in this case, I might have something like 2,600 tables to set out there in my warehouse. This is, I'd say, pretty indicative of, of most customers we work with. Keep in mind, we have customers that have hundreds of thousands, even millions of tables. Other customers that are only monitoring, say, 50, 100, 200 tables. But the idea is, as your data footprint expands, the ability to solve this with you know, manual SQL validations or even off the, excuse me, um, uh, open source software gets a lot harder, right? So what Monte Carlo is going to say is, okay, well, those 2,600 tables, out of the box, what we're going to do is automated monitoring. Uh, and hopefully this kind of harkens back to, in your mind, uh, when John pulls up those uh, five pillars of data observability. The idea is out of the box, Monte Carlo via machine learning is actually going to help us wrap our arms around table freshness, volume, and schema, right? So on a per table basis, we're leveraging machine learning to help us understand how often a particular table gets loaded and how long it can go without being loaded. Also, how many records do we expect to show up? Are there ever deletions? What's the amount of time we can actually go without seeing new records? And then finally, have I added, removed, changed field types on a particular field that's gonna break things downstream? So I'll always say that this idea of automated monitors, super helpful in deploying broadly across everything that we touch. It's really about the, the health of data pipelines, right? So out of the box, you're going to get a very, very good idea of the health of those data pipelines and how they're operating. What this doesn't actually do is check those underlying values in the data to make sure that the data flowing through those pipelines is accurate. So Monte Carlo actually has a suite of what we call custom monitors. The way I'll normally break this out is two separate layers. Probably the best way to show this is if I go to create a new monitor in Monte Carlo, the idea is, well, I can either do more of a, a machine learning based monitor, right? So in this way, we have uh, anomaly detection again through machine learning to help us understand on a per table basis, as I look at a field inside this table, what, what should I expect in terms of null rates or distinctness or the mean value of percentile ranges, right? Again, these are the types of things that you probably could write a test for. Unfortunately, they're going to be highly static, hard to maintain, and difficult to get full coverage for. Whereas I'll show an example here in a second. Monte Carlo is just going to do that out of the box, right? 
Another really good example would be things like dimensional drift for categorical fields. Um, on the other hand, we do support very user-defined rules and tests, right? Similar to what you might do in an open source tool or even uh, manual SQL validations. I can write SQL rules. What Monte Carlo is going to allow me to do is scale this out via things like variableization and SQL templates. That way you can enable non-technical users to write tests for very specific things. Um, but we also support this idea of freshness and volume rules, right? So compare this to what we do out of the box. The idea is if you're an organization that already has SLAs in place or the business already has an understanding of when things should be available, we'll support your ability to finally define exactly what it is that should happen and where those incidents are breached, we'll, we'll essentially treat those as data anomalies. So what I'd love to do actually is, is dive a bit deeper into one of these examples. All right, so we've talked about automated monitors. We've talked about machine learning based custom monitors as well as more uh, user defined custom monitors. The idea is across those three levels, Monte Carlo is gonna give you the tools to check and account for anything that could break within your data, right? But the question that always gets asked is, well, what does this take to actually stand up and configure? And reality is because we're serving up this idea of what are my key assets? What are my key tables? We make it really easy to identify where you actually need coverage. Um, what I'll do actually is, is kind of thumb over to a specific table. That way we can kind of learn what Monte Carlo is checking for, what this looks like and how we're actually categorizing some of these assets. So here I'll just go ahead and search for maybe my subscription table. Within subscription, I can kind of thumb over to more of a, a high level view of the, the health of this particular table. And keep in mind what we're collecting is uh, metadata query logs from this asset that help me understand how often is this thing loaded and when should I expect the next load to actually happen, right? On the right, we're looking at volume. The idea being, well, I can tell you how many records are added to this table. Here I have a period of time where I expected something to show up and it didn't. We'll actually dive deeper into this incident here where I actually have a period of time in which I, uh, I loaded many more records than I would have expected to, which Monte Carlo automatically caught as an anomaly. But the other thing that I'll call out here again is the fact that, well, this table, the reason I picked it is because on a scale of zero to one, the most important table in all my data, right? I've highlighted some of the inputs to this calculation, but the idea is it's read very frequently, written to very often. And actually, because we can integrate with your downstream BI layer, the nice thing is we can even tell you how many BI assets are affected if this table breaks, right? So because we have this idea of important score, I can show you things like reports affected, but the most important thing is I can also show you where we have additional coverage, right? So this idea of a field health monitor here, if I were to click into this, we've enabled this on this table to then go through and not only say, hey, is this data fresh? Is it showing up in the volumes that I expect? But furthermore, things like my ID field, is that ever null, right? Turns out it's never null, but as soon as this would increase from a 0% to maybe like a 0.1% or, or, or above, we would know that that's abnormal. But we're also tracking this across uniqueness, percent zero, percent negative, and all the metrics you see here. So the value of Monte Carlo is extremely fast time to actually stand up and get value, but then accounting for things that you wouldn't normally check for, right? Examples would be running tests on distinctness for some kind of continuous field. Reality is, I, as a data engineer, I'm probably never going to write a test that looks for distinctness on like a quantity or an amount. But reality is that could actually be a pretty good indication of whether or not I'm seeing duplicate data. So it probably is a valid check that Monte Carlo is going to identify. Then one last thing I'm going to call out here back at the table level before we dive into what does an incident look like and how does Monte Carlo allow you to detect and resolve incidents in real time is because we're doing all this broad monitoring across all these objects, we actually give you the ability to surface incident history at a table level, right? So not only is this the most important table in all my data, it also breaks all the time, right? Whether these are volume anomalies, whether these are dimension anomalies, field health anomalies, even things like schema changes would be captured here. And the idea is now I essentially get a, a real life um, representation of how healthy this table is because reality is in more of a legacy approach to data quality, I'm only gonna be able to identify either what I built specific tests for or what an end user actually captures in that BI layer, right? So the idea here is giving you true visibility into what breaks and when, allowing you to fortify pipelines and truly invest in those assets that are most important, such as this one. So it's probably enough at a high level to, to gain an understanding, maybe even too much. But what I'd love to do next is dive into what happens when Monte Carlo identifies an incident 
and what are all the tools that we can actually use, right? So normally we'll be sending an alert to something like uh, Slack, PagerDuty, Microsoft Teams, or even a, a data catalog such as, you know, Alation, Data.World, Atlan, and others. But we're also able to potentially send alerts to service management tools, right? So if you're a shop that currently uses Jira or ServiceNow in order to actually manage and triage incidents, our intent truly is to meet you where you live, right? So in this way, this incident that we had just kind of talked through here is, well, I have my subscription table. What Monte Carlo identified is, I just added 12,000 records to this table and normally I might see 3,700, right? So the assumption is something abnormal happened here, but Monte Carlo can't necessarily say uh, declaratively, is this good, bad, expected? So here's where I as a human kind of get to intervene is saying, well, I actually wasn't expecting this to happen, right? So not only am I going to go and investigate this incident, but as I dive in, I have the ability to do things like define severity, assign ownership, and truly working through a data incident, much in the way that a, a DevOps engineer might work through any other type of, of incident that might occur. So within Monte Carlo, this is what we call our incident management or incident IQ page. And the idea here is, well, I can graphically represent what happened here. You know, it jumps off the page exactly what Monte Carlo is referring to. But the value of this is I'm not just a smoke detector, right? I'm not just sending you an alert and telling you that something happened in any number of channels. What I'm also doing is wrapping this in very, very distinct context of who's affected and should I care. At the end of the day, not all data incidents are created equally. And it just so happens that this one table, this subscription table that we've already identified as our most important asset, gets queried like 270 times a week and actually feeds into 28 downstream BI dashboards, right? So in this case, I'm saying, well, I wanna see these essentially by name. Now I'm actually identifying who's using these reports, what's broken and what might be affected. That way I can both proactively identify users of these dashboards and help them make sure they're not making bad decisions based on poor data, but also giving myself the ability to say, look, 28 dashboards and I just saw one called margin report. Okay, that's a sub two or that's a sub zero that I need to go fix right now, right? So it's giving you and your team the ability to identify high impact incidents, fix them in real time before they hit on users' desks, which is essentially... Um, the highest level goal of what Monte Carlo is providing. So again, detection is one thing. Alerting folks to the fact that something happened is a big deal. But what's more impactful for technical teams is, okay, what tools do I have available to actually tell me what happened and go fix this thing, right? So probably the most prominent that I haven't really even touched upon yet, that's um, that final pillar of the data observability is table lineage, right? So at the end of the day, I have the ability via parsing query logs and actually stitching together automated lineage to say, okay, this raw dot subscription table, I know it's the most important table in all my data. Where does it stand in that pipeline and what's it feeding? So here I'm actually looking upstream at, at object storage. So this data is actually loaded from S3, but downstream, I can also say, okay, well, this bad data is now flowing through my staging subscription table. And I have a table here called prep dot offer conversion prep, right? If I were to expand this all the way out, the beauty of this solution is very, very focused on data quality. I can uh, essentially tell you where along that chain data looks broken and what's it feeding into, right? So here I have a month to date sales executive snapshot Tableau dashboard. And it looks like I could potentially be showing duplicative data or bad data in general. And the idea is, well, now I have some semblance of who's affected and the impact, but now I can leverage some in-platform tools to go fix this thing, right? So here I can look at things like query logs that we're pulling from the application. So at the time that this happened, what did I actually do, right? Turns out that the query that I ran this copy into from, from S3, the exact same query that I run ad nauseum, right? So it's not that I've done some kind of external process or something that was unexpected. And I can actually essentially decide from both lineage and, and this view right here that the bad data that I'm getting is actually coming from an upstream system, right? So you may have noticed I'd actually included some commentary within Slack, but the idea is as I'm resolving and fixing this issue, I can now provide commentary and help the rest of the team understand where we're at in incident resolution, as well as what happened. The beauty here is that Monte Carlo then essentially becomes a runbook to whereas next time this happens, I can now access comment history from past incidents to allow me to see where things have broken in the past and shrink the time that it takes to fix. Another feature here is this idea of integration with tools like DBT. So at the end of the day, what I wanna be able to do is from a single platform, 
not have to hop around. I can actually look at, say, all tables that have had successful model runs. Come to find out, you know, the table that I'm interested in didn't have any issues with my, my transformation or my orchestration tool, right? Again, validating the fact that this is some upstream data problem. But then I'm kind of stuck, right? Because at the end of the day, I can identify the source of the issue. I can't necessarily say when, where, or why it happened, except for Monte Carlo is going to take it a level deeper and actually look at the underlying data in a case like this. And here we call this a correlation analysis. So not only can I pass this off to my friends in application development, I can also give them a little bit more context, right? So Monte Carlo at the time that this happened actually queried the underlying data. Turns out there's a field here called subscription.status. And what we're essentially saying is, hey, there's three statuses, right? So I can be closed, open, or in progress. And normally, as we see here, each of these makes up about 33% of the data. But at the end of the day, this particular incident actually in progress made up about 11,000 of those, call it 14,000 records, right? So here's my ability to now go back to my team and say, hey, the data looks broken. We got a ton of records that we weren't expecting. And it looks like a problem with in-progress subscriptions. I can't give you much more context than that. Certainly we can kind of help. But the other thing I can do is uh, via integrations with tools like Snowflake, DBT, or others, um, wherein you have tags that might give more context to a particular table. Well, I can also say, hey, by the way, this is the, the bucket that stores that data in S3, or this is the Lambda function that's reaching out to the API and pulling that data down, right? So the whole concept of Monte Carlo as it relates to issue resolution is leveraging lineage to determine impact and root cause, leveraging some automation around things like correlation analysis to figure out a little bit more context on these issues, and then finally integrations with tools like DBT or Airflow to let me know what worked, what didn't work, and is anything abnormal happening. So at the end of the day, I, I think that's kind of our, our broad context in terms of how to provide an observability solution that gives you tools to detect, resolve, and prevent. But at the end of the day, serving up a higher level of insight on data health, data quality, and data reliability. So that's honestly all I had in mind for today's uh, demo. I think that's probably more than enough content. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of turn it back to you, Doug. And, and I think there's some questions that have come in that we'd love to talk through. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. That is a deep, I think a pretty good compelling uh, overview. I wanted to talk quickly about a book that you guys are making available. Uh, John, I think you can talk to this. Um, it sounds like yeah. something that would help people really think things through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, feel free to check out. So it's the O'Reilly book on data quality fundamentals. Um, if you just type in, the, hopefully, that fairly short um, URL there, uh, definitely get a free copy. Um, it's It's been really helpful, I think, for a lot of uh, folks uh, in the space to get kind of foundational understanding of uh, topics we talked about today, but even just more broadly on the fundamentals of data quality. So um, definitely check that out. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or um, or any, uh, any thoughts on the book as well. Yeah, it's great. Um, well, speaking of questions, we have some, uh, and I wanted to spin through them. Um, first off, uh, as is often the case, we hear this one a lot, uh, but it's certainly a question that is relevant. Um, how long does it take to get Monte Carlo set up? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk that one, uh, John, as, as the person who's going to be primarily setting these up for a lot of our customers. So I would say step number one is let's figure out what you're actually trying to solve for, understand the problem. In terms of getting Monte Carlo set up, oftentimes we're looking at probably okay an hour's worth of work to set up a service account on Snowflake and Tableau and any other tool we want to integrate with. Uh, and then it's just a matter of essentially providing Monte Carlo credentials, right? So past that, as I mentioned, there's a number of machine learning models and things that are going to automatically train, capturing lineage, capturing context and tags. So at the end of the day, really we're, we're up and running in a matter of usually a couple hours. Uh, and then those models will start to train and, and finish training over the course of normally, I'd say three to five days upwards of two weeks, depending on data velocity and other factors. Well, and Ethan, if you wouldn't mind um, just kind of taking a step back from that. Um, so that's obviously the last bit of a consideration cycle. It's like, all right, let's, let's go to proof of concept or implement some sort of um, test. Uh, prior to that, who are you engaging with? I mean, who, who do you see making the call? Who are you finding, uh, within these organizations, and, and we'll talk about some of the organizations as well, uh, it's a quite an impressive customer list. 
But where are you finding that um, demand, traction, um, engagement? Yeah, happy to take that one. Um, if uh, so, at the end of the day, the the folks that are primarily using Monte Carlo are is data engineering. Um, so they're one the folks that are building pipelines, uh, making the data available to the organization, uh, but oftentimes also the folks that are charged with ensuring the data is uh, usable, trustworthy, uh, high quality. Um, but I'll also say we've talked to folks further down the line as, as consumers as well. So data analytics, data science. Uh, even business teams uh, that are really feeling some of that pain of, hey, this dashboard looks off, or hey, I can't use this asset because, um, or I'm spending time cleaning the data, building my own tables, uh, because the source table isn't uh, uh, isn't something I can necessarily rely on. Um, but by far, uh, data engineering teams are the ones that are uh, in Monte Carlo on a day to day basis. Um, but some teams also use the tool to also communicate to those downstream consumers. Um, so that they know that, hey, this uh, this asset is broken, uh, what the status of that is, whether it's being investigated, when it's been resolved. Uh, so they know when they can use dashboards that were dependent on a on a table, for instance. Excellent. Yeah. Um, another question uh, with regard to access. What does what access does Monte Carlo need in my environment to detect incidents? Yeah, so of everything I had shown in that product demonstration today, um, I'd say probably 90% of it is based on system metadata and query logs, right? So all we really need access to is uh, more higher level system data. And then wherein you deploy things like those custom monitors, that would actually oftentimes require access to select data from a particular table. Um, so the, the benefit of that is, well, now we can kind of rationalize which tables are most important, which we want to apply custom monitors on and be selective about the things that we're actually applying um, select access to. At the end of the day, Monte Carlo is, is always going to be security focused. Um, so our reliance on metadata query logs is super important, but wherein we're actually selecting those tables directly. Just want to make it clear that none of that data makes it in our backend, right? Our intent is to select summarized data and aggregated statistics and then pull those back into our backend to, to build those machine learning models. Understood. Um, John, I think uh, we've got a question that goes back to the um, to the five pillars that you presented uh, in your um, in your deck. And one of them is how do you build lineage? Yeah, does, sure that, uh, does that ring? <laughs> it does. It does. Um, so like Ethan mentioned, uh, setting a monocle is really easy um, within 24 to 48 hours of setting up your integrations. Uh, we actually automatically build lineage uh, by parsing query logs. Um, depending on the integrations that you have, we'll, we'll kind of di uh, we'll dictate what shows up in the lineage. So for instance, if you connect uh, your warehouse, uh, but also your BI tools and orchestration tools, you can see all those relationships uh, and even down to the field level. So for any given field in, your, uh, in a warehouse table, you can see that relationship all the way downstream if it has any um, down to um, within your BI dashboard. Uh, so um, I think this uh, question is, is, you know, something we see often where, where we're introducing a new category of solution and, and folks are trying to compare it to something that they might be more familiar with. But the question is, what's the difference between Monte Carlo and a data catalog? Yeah, uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, and it's one that we, we do get often. Um, so there are definitely, you know, some things that do overlap. Um, from a kind of feature standpoint, I guess you would say, like lineage, for instance. Um, I think the difference between data catalog and data observability uh, really comes down to the use case. Um, and when we talk to different data teams, that's one of the big considerations is what is the use case and what's a, what are you trying to achieve? And the second consideration uh, that I'll come back to is, is the timeline in which you want to achieve it. So from a use case perspective, obviously data catalogs are great for if you're uh, trying to build more governance, uh, governance within your organization, or if you have compliance um, uh, needs, uh, that's what data catalogs are really built for. Uh, observability is really built for data quality and data reliability, um, and also has different users as well. Like we mentioned, data observability is primarily from a data engineering uh, use case perspective. Um, 
So it depends on the use case and what tools. Um, but then uh, the other point to kind of point out is kind of timeline. Um, as I think a lot of folks on the call might know is data catalogs, uh, while they are really powerful, do take a lot of uh, investment from a time perspective from various teams and organization to really make work uh, from documentation to processes that get in place. Um, the big difference in data observability is it's automation first. Um, the idea is like, like we've talked about, it's quick to set up your integrations. Um, but what we really want to help teams do is quickly detect incidents, uh, but then resolve them. Um, so again, both use case and kind of time line in which you're trying to achieve um, your objectives. Um, so I would, I would focus more on that versus like feature function, like what, what does a data catalog have versus observability. Um, if, if folks are interested, we can definitely share some uh, some content on that in, in terms of getting into more details between the two, uh, two tools as well. Great. Um, with regard to timeline um, and use case, uh, you have a pretty hefty customer page with uh, some big brand names. Um, can either one of you or maybe both of you take a crack at um, kind of walking us through kind of the uh, uh, customer journey, not, not how they ended up purchasing, but how they ended up landing and kind of expanding, you know, what, how do they typically start? Um, if you have some examples, you know, how they have grown more than likely, I would expect uh, they, they start to dig into different um, features and functions and so forth. What have you seen? Do you have any examples that you can share with us? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that, and Ethan definitely jump in anytime here. I think there's, it almost fits into like three different buckets of kind of like types of use cases that we see. Um, the first one is a more, a little, I'll we'll call it more reactive where there's an incident that's happened. So whether it's, you know, the, the CEO finds an issue in a financial report or CFO or whoever it might be, or just constant, you know, inquiries from downstream consumers and, and different business teams on, hey, this data doesn't look right. Uh, some kind of event that has happened that is going to steer a data engineering team to say, okay, we need to fix this. We can't keep spending hours, um, like we said, up to 50% of our time just fixing issues. Um, so there is a, something has happened uh, and we need a way to, to, to make sure the data is actually trustworthy. Um, the second one that we're starting to see more and more is um, a little bit more proactive angle where um, there's an initiative that takes place where data quality is oftentimes um, a critical uh, reason for uh, a critical kind of um, capability to exist for it to work. So uh, data mesh is something we're probably all hearing about. Uh, whether you call it data mesh or really trying to decentralize analytics and allow more folks to self-serve, whichever model you want to uh, talk about, like a lot of teams realize our data quality, if we're going to get adoption of the data products that we build, uh, the data assets that are out there, like obviously, uh, or maybe not obviously, but the, the data has to be in a state where consumers can trust it without constantly spending all their time um, either QAing the data or fixing it. Um, and I would say the third, which uh, is now coming up a little bit more, um, is data observability is kind of now seen as part of that modern data stack, um, as part of the ecosystem that is, um, Doug, you mentioned in the beginning of the call, it's one of those upcoming trends. Um, I think teams are realizing, oh, there is, there is now a tool out there that can help me save time by not writing all these manual tests that can actually scale across my, um, across my stack. Um, but I think also, again, more importantly is not just find the issues and ring the uh, alarm, but also like, what are the tools and putting all the insights in place that some of which Ethan shared to actually resolve an incident as quickly as possible? Because I think a lot of times what we hear from, um, from data teams is, uh, it's, it's not just about, um, one, they want to be the first to know to resolve an incident, uh, when an incident does occur. But the second is it's great when they can actually proactively communicate, hey, we found an incident, but don't worry, we're investigating it and we'll let you know as soon as it's resolved, as opposed to you know, the CEO coming, calling at 4 a.m. when they're checking a dashboard and saying, hey, this is broken. Why is this fixed? 
Yeah. Yeah. Ethan Maybe again. the one thing I would call out there in addition, John, is mapping to kind of that second bucket, right? We're, we're rolling out. Um, maybe data mesh methodology or, or we're kind of changing the way we think about data. Um, for folks who are rolling out new data products, especially externally facing data products, there is this emphasis on we need to get this right the first time, right? Um, and I, I think that's a key consideration is what's the actual use of your data and folks that are leveraging data strategically internally or powering external value are going to need that layer of insurance to ensure that um, at the end of the day, the data we're serving to our end users wherever they live is is accurate. Yeah, we're seeing a, a term called data monetization. Um, that is, uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys can speak to that a little bit about how people are thinking about it, that internally to some of these teams. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of data leaders that we talk to, um, the ideal state is to get to the point where um, one, you're, you're, you can invest your time for both data engineering, but also data science to be able to work closely with the business teams and actually derive new use cases for data, um, ideally in a way that can be revenue accretive for a company. Um, so it's something that's happening more and more. Um, but I think the challenge that everybody's finding is finding that time to have these, uh, to spend on these more value added initiatives. Um, and I mean that from both a, um, being closer to the business users after having that trust that's built um, and be able to spend more time with them to understand uh, the various use cases and have the business context. But then it's also to like having the time to actually invest in building out, whether it's data products uh, or whatever it might be, uh, or pipelines to actually support some of these initiatives. Uh, so, so how do people engage? I mean, let's, let's get down to brass tacks. We've, we've got a compelling product here. We've got a, <laughs> an eager audience. Um, they want to learn more. Um, what are you, what are you suggesting is the best path? Uh, probably Ethan, maybe you probably have the best idea of how, how best to do this. I mean, what, what should they be thinking about? Um, maybe even prior to, uh, to reaching out. Yeah. To me, the interesting thing about data observability more than, you know, in my experience selling BI solutions, it's, very use case focused, very industry specific. Uh, a lot of folks are going to be experiencing the same pain, regardless of industry, regardless of tech stack. But I would say that Monte Carlo specifically does a really good job of publishing case studies, making it very well known how our customers are using the tool. So I would recommend anyone that has interest, go out to our website and start to explore, right? The best way to identify, is this going to work for my use cases to learn how your peers are, are leveraging the technology? Um, from there, there's going to be calls to action on our website to schedule a demo, learn more. And that's typically when you know a person like myself will get involved to really start to bridge that gap between what are the Monte Carlo core functionalities and what are you looking for in a tool, right? And nine times out of 10, those things tend to align. Um, and that's kind of the kickoff of a true evaluation, making sure that Monte Carlo is going to check the boxes. Well, and I see on the, on the website as well, you have a, a developer hub. Um, can you can you can either of you talk a little bit about you know how kind of the ecosystem and how uh, with regard to support how Monte Carlo um, stands you know with that sort of support layer? Yeah, um, I guess uh, let me know if I'm answering this correctly or if this is what you're looking for. Um, so there. Uh, there is, so on the, on the, on our website, you can access, um, our product documentation. Um, so if you have any questions around like how the integrations work, uh, more details around the monitors that are available, uh, or tools that are available, definitely check that out. Um, there are obviously more written for folks that have access to the platform already. Um, but there is good information out there, um, specifically around like what integrations we offer. Um, uh, Doug, the other part of the question that maybe you're asking, and Ethan can definitely speak more to this, is there is some developer-specific kind of content on there as well, specifically around, um, for instance, accessing our API or SDK. Um, yeah, that, I, yeah, I wasn't terribly clear, but effectively, that's what I was asking about. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, what basically like we want to make the API SDK available. Um, Teams can also deploy our monitors as part of their CI CD process. Uh, so there's documentation for that as well. Uh, but basically, like we really built Monte Carlo to really fit into existing, call it data ops processes. 
Um, so whether you know you're um, using an API because you want to build a way to um, you know expose the status or incidents on your BI dashboard or for any given dashboard, any incidents associated with it. Uh, or if you, again, want to deploy monitors as part of your existing uh, deployment process, uh, we want to enable that. Um, Ethan, any thoughts or anything to add? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, especially for technical technical folks, the question is always going to be, what can I do from a command line or from a script rather than accessing a UI? And I think, you know, we're starting to think more and more through how to accommodate multiple personas, right? So non-technical folks are going to need a little bit more hand-holding, whereas people that are, are experienced are going to look for efficiencies gained through things like script-based methodology. So um, the goal is to support everything and everyone and make it easy to use. Uh, well, with, uh, you know, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, and I always like to ask um, for advice uh, at the end. Um, so I'd like for both of you to, to offer up your best advice, but, you know, as, as data teams are looking at, you know, what they're faced with, and I, I mean, honestly, they're faced with a lot of things right now, not only the onslaught of uh, all the data and, uh, and the, the sources and, and, uh, and the tracking and, and obviously the reliability, um, but they're also looking at, a, a I would say, arguably maybe an uncertain economy at this point. Uh, and and you know another year with uh, you know a changing workforce. I mean, how do you? How would you? If you could look into the crystal ball and provide some advice as to how people should start thinking about their data strategy, uh, and obviously this you would I'm sure recommend be a part of it. But can you give kind of a broader set of guidance around how people might want to think about things in 2023? Yeah, I think one thing that comes to mind, because it's, to your point, Doug, it's come up a lot. Um, I think there's the the time horizon that folks are looking to right now at this moment are, is fairly condensed. It's how do I make it through the next six months, next year, um, and typically with the team that I have. Um, and I think one thing that uh, a lot of the teams that we're talking to are starting to think about is, how do I make the most of the resources that I have, both the technologies that I already have, uh, but also the the team that are and resources that I have uh, with my. Um, and one thing to think about is again going back to how much is the team spending on things that could be fixed uh, or more readily resolved. Um, so think about how much time a data engineering team is spending on fixing issues um, as opposed to building new pipelines and, and um, serving the business. Um, I think think through those, like typically what we've seen is like when you really dig into how much time is finding one, the number of incidents you have two is how much time is team spending on finding those incidents, resolving them. Like, um, there is, there is a big kind of resource. I wouldn't call it savings cause it's not like you're, you're going to, you know, uh, but it's more of the time that you can get back from a data engineer or engineering perspective, uh, to spin on more value added activities as opposed to. Yeah. Your questions constantly, yeah, et yeah, no, I think that's interesting, and I think it's keen observation is the idea of, of using, obviously, as we all want to use technology to gain efficiencies in a, a bit of an uncertain time for business planning. Ethan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. I would say there's going to be conflicting priorities across resource constraints. Essentially, I might have less people or I might have less resources to invest but still a voracious appetite for data, right? How do I use data to drive decisions? And I think to your point, Doug, leveraging technology to bridge that gap and say, well, how do I offload the need to build a mountain's worth of tests and leverage an automated solution to do that while still giving my business, you know, new data products and access to new data to make decisions. Um, that's kind of the sweet spot, right? So I'd say certainly not a fortuitous uh, economic climate, but I think that's kind of what drives innovation. So I'm excited to see what 2023 brings. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you both for your participation today. I think that was a, a very valuable spotlight for us. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks yeah, everyone for thank joining. Great to see you. Well, there you have it. Another solution in our spotlight.
We want to thank Monte Carlo and in particular John and Ethan for their fine presentation. And we appreciate your participation as well. Until next time, I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review. Thanks for watching.